All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming during such cold weather. Um, I think you all can, or almost all can see your grades from the first homework now. And um, I think you got the news that if there is any issues and you need, uh, you want something to regrade, you have a week from the time uh, the grades were released to do so. So please uh, make sure to do that on time if you would like us to check anything. Um, yeah, the homework uh, solutions generally look fine. Yeah, go ahead. So I thought that the, the like tax question was a bonus, mm -hmm. but it seems like on Canvas or on Ontario scope, mm -hmm. that our phone is not 102 instead of 100. Is that the case? Um, I'm not sure. We can look into it that it's you know considered as a bonus. It's definitely a bonus. We call this uh, time grade yeah yeah so it was definitely a bonus bonus um all right and this wednesday the second homework is due so you know um don't forget about that um last time the recording didn't work out only the first 20 minutes of um of the lecture were actually recorded so on piazza i posted um the materials that are closest to what i was presenting last time in case you want to kind of um in case you are watching recording basically after after the lecture um all righty and uh for today's policy we are going to go over safety at the u uh and it's very short basically you have a ton of uh helpful videos and resources on safeu.utah.edu and in any case if you see anything uh that seems suspicious to you uh you have you can call uh campus police uh and you have um their address and other information available here all righty um yeah, I wanted to mention this paper that came uh, in my archive feed uh, or my reading list uh, randomly, but then it turns out that I used mean hashing with the Jacquard similarity, and I thought I could share it with you. So basically, they use that, the, the technique we have gone through to find uh, instances in the pre-training corpus that are basically duplicates. They removed it and then train the language model over it and got a better language model. So it's kind of nice to see, you know, something you have just learned to be published in 2022. So very, very cutting edge. All right, we are going to close that and go over here. Mm, okay, so um, I wanna go over some of the things we had talked about last time, but I either rushed through them or I didn't, I don't think I maybe explained them sufficiently well. Uh, one of them is that uh, S curve that we have seen. Um, so we had curve for the probability of being a candidate. And we have here Jacquard similarity. All right. And um, a pair was a candidate. A, if the if we had hashed them uh, their little sub signature into the same bucket, that that's what uh, what candidate uh, being a candidate meant. So it was dependent of the choice of the mean hash uh, of the function we have uh, chosen, and that function that gave us values in signature was mean hash function. So that's important. Um, okay. So S curve. This, this, um, so we said that uh, this uh, 
Jacquard similarity versus uh, probability of candidate will have this kind of S uh, curve. Uh, no matter what the parameters B or R we choose, it's always going to have a S shape. Okay, and I have said that where this uh, curve increases rapidly, that that point is important. Basically, that point here, this similarity here, is similarity after which true, uh, so uh, pairs that have true Jacquard similarity above that threshold will have very high probability of being a candidate pair under the mean hashing uh, family of uh, functions, of hash functions. And this is, you know, kind of like a soundness check. This is what we want. We want our hash function to give us this kind of property that if uh, the, true, uh, the truly highly similar pair uh, that they have a high probability of becoming, uh, of ending up in the same bucket under that hash function. So first of all, this is kind of like, we see it and we think, okay, this makes sense. Um, but another thing I, I don't think I have made super clear. So I said, okay, this, this uh, inflection point will be approximately at one over B, one over R. Um, and we can basically change B and R such that we shift this threshold to the left or to the right. And what I mean by that is, for example, let's say you want to have, um, you want to avoid, uh, let's say, uh, false uh, negatives. So you want, you don't want to end up uh, with a situation where you discarded some very similar pairs uh, because you have used to you know, two aggressive uh, parameters B and R. So let's think about situation where we have avoid false negatives. Basically what we can do is we can pick B and R such that our threshold D is lower. So basically this inflection point here will be a little bit to the left. It will be uh, smaller. Um, and also, we can have another situation where we are really, really concerned about, our, about, about speed. So we want to have less candidate pairs in general. Um, and um, we don't want those false positives to end up in our set of uh, candidate pairs. So we are wanting to avoid false positives because speed is important to us. So we would pick b and r such that threshold d is higher okay and i will show you just a few plot from the m4d book um, which kind of demonstrates this situation i'll just wait a second that uh, you all write this down if you're writing down okay um so here uh we have basically this um s shape curves for different values of B and R. Uh, so for example, if we had two bends, but we increase the number of rows that each bend will have, then the, the threshold for S will become smaller and smaller, which means that um, for very small value of similarity S, your uh, pairs will become uh, candidate pairs. Uh, and if you are really want to avoid false uh, negatives, this is maybe a situation you want. So now here, uh, one thing might be like immediately confusing for you, and that's that B times R for different values of R and the fixed B doesn't uh, give you the same number, which is the number of uh, rows in your signatures, the dimension of the signature vector, or the number of mean hash functions you are using. So basically that means that, okay, if you really want to change where this threshold is, you can also think about including more or less uh, hash functions. So for example, if you want to have, a, uh, you want, really, really want to avoid all false negatives, you want that threshold to be really low, you figure, okay, I would need B and R to be something like this. And for that, I would need, need two times 32, which is 64 hash functions. So. The point here is that depending on your problem, you might want to avoid certain situations such as avoiding false positives or false negatives. And these values of B and R and the number of hash functions, that is the dimension of your signature vector, play a role in that. And this is something you need to 
decide as your modeling uh, decision. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, let me try to open my... Okay, um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say about this, this uh, thresholding thing uh, that um, wasn't clear uh, last time. And then uh, if you remember when we have uh, finished our lecture, we have made a definition of um, being um, D1, D2, P1, P2 uh, sensitive, right? And um, the reason why we wrote this um, definition last time is to kind of um, say that this uh, theory of uh, LSH is not specific to the mean hash family of functions and Jacquard similarity. We said we can use different families of uh, hash functions with different uh, similarity or distance uh, distance uh, measures. Okay, so um, I want to comment on that a little bit more. Uh, so basically, let's return to that definition. So we had D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive. And let's again visualize something. So here we will have uh, distance, which is uh, slightly different from similarity, and that's actually what we are going to talk in the rest of the lecture. But distance, unlike similarity, when it's small, that means that uh, X and I are similar. Unlike similarity, where you know if X and I are uh, have small similarity measure, then they are not similar. Okay, and let's say we have D1, we have D2, and we have values P2 and P1. Um, and here we have the probability that the our hash function will put two uh, points X and I to the to the uh, same bucket. And now we are talking about hash functions that are alike mean hashing in a sense that they will be useful for LSH uh, technique, which means that HX equals to HI for us kind of means, yes, make them a candidate pair, right? And what the um, D1, D1, D2, P1, uh, P2 sensitivity tells us is just that, okay, when we have that if the, um, if two points are uh, at most D1 um, uh, apart, uh, so that the distance between them is small, which means that they are similar, then this probability should be high. At least uh, it is at, at least P1 uh, uh, is the probability that they will hash into the same bucket. And on the other hand, if they are kind of dissimilar, if the distance is larger than two, then uh, the probability that they are going to hash into the same bucket is at most P2. And this is nice, right? We want this property. So mean hashing has that kind of property with Jacquard similarity. And that's that's good because our end goal is that our these hashing functions put our similar examples into the same bucket and this similar example uh, not in the same bucket. So this kind of uh, definition of uh, D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitivity is a kind of like a more formal way of saying all of that. So um, just going back uh, to this point that we want to find more distances uh, with another family families of hash functions, uh, well, they have to have this, uh, this uh, property uh, because that's our goal, basically. All righty. Um, so, uh, yeah, please. Can you explain how you read that graph again? Like, I'm confused about how it's only in two quadrants or two parts of it. Um, which part do you mean? Like, can you just explain how you read that? Yeah, so you have D1, right? And if X and I, which are some points or two documents, let's say, that you are comparing, if they are at most D1, uh, if their distance is at most D1, then their probability of two of them being hashed to the same bucket will be uh, at least P1. Uh, on the other hand, if their distance is um, 
D2 or higher, which means that they are uh, dissimilar, then uh, the probability they are going to hash uh, uh, into the same uh, bucket is at most P2, which is some small value. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you got it. Okay, so basically uh, uh, Jacquard uh, distance, which is uh, one minus uh, Jacquard similarity and um, mean hashing family have this property and specifically they are D1, D2, one minus D1, one minus D2 sensitive. Family where uh, we have that um, D1 is smaller than D2, which is uh, both of them are bounded by zero and one. Um, I won't go into details why this holds. It's very simple to derive it. Uh, if you are interested, you can go to Mining Massive Datasets book at uh, section 362 on page uh, one four. Um, the derivation is very simple. Uh, I just want to use time for, for other things. Okay, so um, as I said probably two times at least today, the goal is that uh, we are finding uh, more of these families and more of these distances, which uh, you can combine to get the LSH technique. And for that, we need to learn more about distances, right? So today we are going to just go over a bunch of, uh, a bunch of distance functions and they will be important not only to kind of understand what other, at least one uh, other, you know, uh, distance plus hashing function family that we can use for LSH technique. They will also be incredibly important for the rest of this course, especially when we start going into clustering, which is our next uh, big topic. So today we won't go over almost any algorithms. This will just be here are a bunch of uh, distance functions you will use uh, in the future. So in a way, it is kind of like a little, a little detour. Um, but it's a it's an important one. So, title is distances. Which day it is today? Oh, it's already end of January. Sad. All right. So, um, we we have talked about one similarity measure that's Jacquard similarity, and you know similarity measures and distance measures are related. So with similarity, we had that if uh, two points X and I are similar, then the similarity value between two of them will be a large, right? With where large depends on what is your similarity measure bounded with. If it's bounded with, let's say one then being close to one means that these two things are similar. At the other hand, uh, distances, uh, when two things are similar, then uh, their distance between them will be small. So I want to raise this just because it's going to be a little bit opposite of you know what we have talked about when we talked about uh, similarities. And unlike similarity measures, which we didn't define, you know, formally in a mathematical way, uh, distance measure, distance function have very uh, specific uh, uh, mathematical definitions, which we will uh, write down. So here we have, oops, I'm so sorry. All right, so um, definition goes a distance. D uh, from some set of points X times X. So um, you take two points and each point uh, is in a set of uh, X that maps to zero to infinity. So to all positive uh, uh, real numbers, including zero um, is a map which maps pairs of points from um, X to a non-negative 
real number. And we'll say that the distance is a metric if it satisfies certain properties. First property is that it's non-negative. Okay. So when you talk about, you know, how far is something from something else, you give, um, you know, zero or a higher number. You don't say something is um, minus something apart. Then uh, we'll say that um, the distance is zero if and only if A equals uh, B. So, you know, if we talk about distance of walking to from A to B, it will be zero only if you are at the same location. Um, then we have symmetry that the distance from A to B equals from uh, distance from B to A. So if we take the same path from location, I don't know, from this room back to Merrill Engineering, then uh, if someone else goes with the same path back to us, uh, we are going to uh, walk the same distance. That's called symmetry. All right, and the final one, uh, which is called triangle inequality, just says, okay, if we are going from location A to B, we take the shortest path from A to B, this is definitely going to be shorter than if we decide to, let's say, decide, we decide to go grab a coffee. We introduce third location and we go to this location and then to, to B. So the distance A to B is always going to be smaller than A distance from A to C plus the distance to C to B. Um, and is, you will see today in the lecture that we call some things uh, distances, but that they don't fulfill all of these properties. That's why we kind of distangle them between distance and metric. Um, in mathematics, very often these things will be just uh, assumed to be the same. Um, so just be aware of that, that sometimes you will read that something is um, is a distance is called distance and it will not fulfill all of these uh this property but sometimes people when they talk to each other they will assume that a distance is a metric and that's just not correct but um have that in mind okay um all right so if uh property number two is not satisfied then i will call such a distance pseudometric And if uh, property number three is not satisfied, you will see them under the term quasi metrics. Yeah, which, yeah, it's not super important how we call these things, uh, but, you know, if you do encounter pseudo or quasi, um, try to remember that one of the properties is not uh, satisfied. Okay, and that's the definition of. Uh, of uh, distance and metric. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, quasi metric, uh, one where we don't have a symmetry. So we'll talk about uh, cosine distance, and then you can have, let's say, uh, you know, you can make a full circle, and um, these two points will kind of behave similarly, uh, but. Um, you know, they will have the same cosine or as well if they we increase their magnitude, it won't be important because we are just looking at the angle between two of them. Yep. This thing is only existing in put in uh but in like field or yeah. I mean I guess yeah. not everyone put in doesn't have this but I'm thinking like yeah, yeah, you are completely right. I was saying the shortest path to give an analogy with something, but not necessarily all distances are in Euclidean spaces. Okay. Yeah, so that's why we said like a set of points X. So, so the, the definition of distance plus the definition of the definition of Yeah, that's correct. 
Okay, let's let's move on. Um, so we talked about jacquard similarity. There is, of course, jacquard distance then. Um, and it is defined as, you know, just one minus uh, jacquard similarity. So we'll have one minus jacquard similarity A and B. Um, and yeah, let's just quickly go over why this is uh, this is a uh, this is a metric. So first one, we'll have um, it needs to we need to show that um, it is larger or equal than zero, and this will be the case because uh, the cardinality of intersection will be smaller than the cardinality of union. And uh, just a reminder that um, similarity was, Jacquard similarity was defined as the intersection over union, right? So that will hold. Then we'll have the second property is that uh, Jacquard similarity is, um, um sorry just okay that is zero only if uh, if um so the second property says that the jacquard distance is uh, zero only if uh if uh, the two things are exactly the same and we know that okay jacquard similarity uh, jacquard distance of the same point like even the same point is equals one minus jacquard similarity of a with a and then uh, this thing will be one because uh, the intersection of the set with itself will be uh, exactly the same as union of the set with itself. And then this is equal to zero. Okay, that's good. But then what if um, we have two points that are uh, dissimilar? Well, then uh, their intersection will be strictly smaller, the cardinality of their intersection will be strictly smaller than the cardinality of their union. So the Jacquard distance will strictly be positive. So we know that uh, Jacquard distance can be zero only if the, we are talking about the distance of an element with itself. Okay, uh, the third one is that the is uh, symmetric. So the Jacquard distance of AB equals to Jacquard distance of BA. And this will be true because um, intersection and union operations are symmetric as well. So if we take A intersection B, that's the same as B intersection A. A, A union B is the same as uh, B union A. Okay. Um, can I move to the next thing? I need to prove the triangle inequality, but I'll need a little bit more space. Okay. All right, so the fourth one, which is our triangle uh, inequality says that the Jacquard distance of A and B has to be smaller than Jacquard distance of A uh, and C plus uh, Jacquard distance of C plus B. All right, um, so the first thing that's important to recognize is that the this uh, might not hold only for cases where we have uh, C uh, being a subset of both A and uh, B. Otherwise, if this is not the case, then this part here will always be larger than the part on the left because we are including something in the part to the right and not including something to the part on the left. So this case is the only one that's interesting to, to look at. Um, it is also good to mention here that if we rewrite our Jacquard distance, which is one minus Jacquard similarity, then uh, we can get uh, the following um, expression that that's equal to the symmetric difference between A and B over their union. And reminder that if we have A and B, this is their symmetric uh, difference. All right, so let's let's see uh, 
let's show that uh, the triangle inequality holds even for this case where our set C is the subset of both A and B, only case where the triangle inequality has any chance of falling apart. And we will actually start with the uh, with the um, term on the right of the inequality and show that even for this case, it's larger than the term on the left, which is Jacquard similarity between A and B. All right, so um, we are going to use this formula here and we are going to just uh, rewrite it a little bit. So A union B is the same as a uh, cardinality of A plus um, whatever is in C without A. Um, so to visualize that, imagine these are our set, A and C, this is the everything what's in A, and then everything that's in C is not in A is here. And then when we uh, sum these two things, we get the same uh, cardinality as the cardinality of the union. Then uh, similarly, we will rewrite the symmetric difference as a, uh, everything that's in A and not in C plus everything that's in C and not in A. Um, and one thing you can notice here is that, okay, because the uh, our set C is actually subset of A, this is C, this is A, then everything that's C and not in A equals to zero. So this is zero and this is zero. Okay. And with the same same reasoning, we get that um, here we have everything that's in C and not in B, and the over the cardinality of B. Okay. So another thing you can notice here is that um, whatever is the cardinality of A, that's going to be smaller than cardinality of A union B, right? That just makes sense. Union will always have at least the same amount or more of the elements. So, um, okay, if a uh, cardinality of A is smaller than cardinality of A union B, then if we take the inverse, inverse one over A will be larger than one over uh, cardinality of the union. Okay, so we know that this is larger than A without C, so whatever was written before over one, uh, over A union B. And same here. Okay, and this is then when we put it uh, in the same fraction, uh, above the fraction line, we have everything that's not in A, but it uh, is everything that's in A and not in C, and everything that's in C and in not in, um, um, Okay, sorry, there should, this is a mistake here. Uh, this is not symmetric. So here we'll have a union B. Um, and let me just think about a second. Um, before I said something incorrect. Okay, so, and this should be equal to the symmetric difference of um, A uh, and B, where we'll probably use the fact that the C is the subset of both uh, A and B, which is exactly the, the Jacquard distance between A uh, and B. Uh, so we then see, we started with here, and we have shown that this is larger than this value here. That is our triangle inequality holds, even for this case where we had the only chance of it's not holding. So it holds for all the cases and therefore Jacquard distance is the metric. Okay, did we write this down? All right, so now we are just doing our super fun marathon of going over a bunch of distances. We are going to start with the one that you all know, 
which is the Euclidean distance. And I'm not going to prove uh, whenever distance now is a metric, I will not you know, show again that it's metric. Um, I hope this exercise with Jacquard distance was uh, enough to see how you will go about that. So uh, the, the Euclidean distance between uh, A and B will be equal to the square root of the sum of all the dimension of the squares of the difference of their dimensions. Um, and that's equal to the norm, to norm of A minus uh, B. Remembering the spaces where we have scalar product defined and the norm uh, of, uh, uh, of a, you know, a vector is equal, okay, I will use X here. So if we have X, it's two norm will be its um, scalar product with itself, the square root of the scalar product with itself. So that's why this is a, a two norm. Actually, um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, and you know, I think we have all seen this a gazillion times. If you have two points, A1, A2, B1, B2, then this is what their uh, Euclidean distance is, right? Um, but this uh, fact that this is the um, two norm of the difference between A and B, it's kind of related to some other metrics. So let's look into a few of them uh, as well. One of them will be Manhattan distance, which is defined as one norm between uh, of the difference uh, between A and B, which is um, the sum of the absolute values of their of the of the uh, difference between each one of their corresponding dimensions. And here so now, if we have a one, a two, b one, b two, so here we have point one. Here we have point two. Well, we are not going to take this shortest path from one to another like we did with Euclidean distance. We are going to go from uh, A1 to B1 and then from A2 to B2. Um, and that's why it's called Manhattan distance. If it's the path you would take if you are walking on a grid in a town like Manhattan or for that matter, Salt Lake City. Um, and of course, when I say that, maybe immediately think, okay, this could be useful for some kind of traffic applications where we are actually moving uh, on a grid uh, instead of you know having the ability to just find the shortest path of the things. And um, as I kind of hinted on with the Euclidean distance, you know, again, we had the, uh, one norm of the uh, vector difference between these two, we can we can generalize this, and this uh, generalization will be called uh, LP distances, where um, P goes from one to infinity, and it is equal to the P norm of excuse me, on this side between A and B distance between A and B equals to the P norm between the difference uh, vector of A and B, which will be equal to uh, first sum of um, AI minus BI to the power of B. And then this whole sum will be put to the power of one over B. So if you put values P equals one and two, you would get Manhattan and the Euclidean distance. All right, and there is one more L distance called L uh, max norm or L, we write it L infinity norm where we would have distance between X and I would be equal to max norm. Excuse me, 
I can't decide between A and B. Okay, distance between A and B equals to A minus B in their max norm, which is basically you take, um, when we calculate um, the difference between their dimensions, uh, AI minus B1, we would take the one which is the largest. The idea being, if you are, you know, putting P in the previous formula to a very huge value, then the mention that's you know the largest will kind of dominate everything else and therefore we it's sufficient to look only at at one of them all right so i remember that writing bunch of things is not super fun so let's try to do a little exercise and calculate some of these uh, norms just to be sure we get get them all righty so um because it's very hard to for you, like to put the text of what I wanted you to do in one screen and then share the another, I uploaded this uh, figure which tells you what to do. But you will need to open um, this poll here. So basically here. Okay, I can show this. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of give me signals when you are ready to submit and I will bring back the other window where it's written where you should submit it. Okay, maybe I should go there for a second just so you can see it. It's over here. Do you see this? Here. Once again, it would be great to have a shorter last name. I could have. Been thinking about this when I was um, registering, <laughs> but I always forget. Okay, so that's the link, and then I'll keep it this one open. But let me know if you need to go back to the the link. You know. Okay, this is the link that will give you this, and then you submit your solution, and just try to uh, record them like this. Such that you can compare the response. So L2, comma, L1, comma, LN, the max norm uh, in that order. So I second. It's not on. Yeah. We'll figure that out. All right. It says it's active. Uh, can you maybe refresh? Because it says it's active, so it should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, activate. How about now? No. All right. Okay. I can't believe I didn't manage to make it work a single time. <laughs> okay. Where? And we can figure out how people can respond. Maybe, or... mm -hmm. How people can, everyone, no restrictions. You read about that. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. We, it seems like I clicked only uh, via messaging instead of both website and messaging. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, are we done? No? Where are we stuck? Done? Done? No? I don't know the infinity one. The max? Yeah, the R max of the. Not the R max. You just calculate, you know, the element wide difference. Uh, and then you just pick the one which is the Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's just because it's called with such a fancy name it, that it confused you, I'm sure. I was thinking of like uh, like ex like exponential because that's the one. Oh, there's no one plus. There's no one plus. <laughs> Okay, I think this is enough time for this. Let now see. Okay, just one. Okay, I think we can see the clock. Oh, there is a smiley face. That makes... Oh no, that looks terrible. <laughs> but the smiley face does make me. Okay, uh, all right. 574 is correct. L1 is 7. 574. Okay, this is so slow. Huh. 25. Oh. <laughs> We're changing the number. Uh, L2 is actually 5. 574. Okay. Um, seems like there are mostly correct answers here. Okay. So Seems like we are forgetting to take the square root of um, for the L2 distance. So just don't forget to do that. All right, so I don't see any terribly, terribly incorrect answer. Ah, there is the image. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So seems like you guys got a hold of it because uh, 574 is uh, what should uh, needed to get for uh, these numbers. So yeah, then let's move forward. I, I won't show, you know, waste time on deriving it since you got it correctly. Just don't forget to take the square root when you are calculating Euclidean distance. Um, one thing that's worthwhile to mention with LP distances uh, is uh, unit balls, which is the uh, vectors that have norm one in the space. Uh, so let's say we have a vector, which is a zero vector. And let's uh, look at all A element this uh, a space such that their difference, their LP distance equals to one. And something you'll see a lot in the literature are the plots like this, and that's kind of why we are also mentioning it. So this is your B, it's the initial point. So all the, oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can't do them. Okay, so all A, uh, when we are at least in R2, uh, such that the difference between A and uh, you know uh, zero vector is uh, one in LP distance will make this a uh, circle. However, if we are talking about uh, Manhattan distance, L1, then all such A's will be uh, here on this square. This should be all same, same uh, distances, but I can't draw well. Um, and then if we had the max norm, where P equals to infinity, we will get a square like this. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you printed this earlier, but um, this is only for like real values. For, like, I wonder since you do this is that it's for the imaginary, like, well, I mean, that's like, mm. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, for sure, uh, it exists, even if you are, you know, talking about complex numbers, we won't, you know, talk about these things. It is, it is, um, like, at least in, when we work with NLP, it has been shown if we work with complex numbers instead of real numbers, it can be useful because of symmetry that complex numbers shows and the real numbers don't show. So if you're working with, say, uh, you want to predict some relation uh, between two things, uh, working with this is called um, knowledge-based completion. You're find, trying to find, or link prediction, trying to find a link between two things. Working in complex spaces can be uh, useful. If you reach out to me later, I can point you to, to this work. So um, yeah, but we, we will not talk about it uh, here, at least today. Um, but another thing related to this, you know, are we working now with just real numbers, um, is the fact that, you know, sometimes you won't have features that are all corresponding to the same units. Um, so for example, the most, I think, uh, normal thing you could see is something like age and height and whatever weight to represent, I don't know, maybe a patient. All of these things are have different, you know, scale uh, when we talk about them. So for age, you know, um, uh, we'll probably talk about zero to maybe 120 and for height and weight, we will call, use different uh, units. Um, so you can't just make this feature vector, put these numbers and then use uh, LP distances because these things are representing completely different things. Um, if you had something like uh, temperature in Celsius in January, then you know in February and so on, Yes, then you can use the uh, LP distances because these things are represented with the same units. However, in real data mining problems, very often you will have exactly the first situation where you don't have this, um, these units. Um, and then you need to scale things to be kind of normalized to the same bounds. Um, or you kind of maybe separate parts of your features that are represented with the same unit, calculate similarity for those parts and then combine them, just take a weighted uh, combination of these smaller similarities together. Um, and for all of that, uh, there is one uh, useful uh, distance called Mahala Nobis distance where you will actually introduce this uh, scaling um, of, of different dimensions through a matrix called M. So the, the distance will have the following form. You will have A minus B transpose times matrix M, uh, B, uh, excuse me, A minus uh, B. And this matrix M will be element you just a D times D dimensional matrix, your A and B are um, in RD, but the matrix M will also be positive definite. And you all have taken a linear algebra course. I'm sure you have heard about this uh, before. We will not go into what this is uh, right now if you have forgotten because it's not uh, crucial for understanding this. Um, this um, what what all of this is, but when m is positive and definite, then uh, the the dm this uh, distance is a metric. Okay, so basically m what it represents is how to scale coordinates, how to shrink some, and how to expand the others to let's say get to the same bounds for each one of these dimensions such that you can then have a more meaningful representation and work in these spaces. If we have identity metrics here, then uh, the, uh, this uh, Mahalanobis um, distance will be uh, the same as your Euclidean distance. Um, so not super useful because you already have a Euclidean distance, but um, you might introduce something like this. You might put use a diagonal matrix with values N1, MD. So that means we have the diagonal, we have values N1 to MD and zeros otherwise. And these values M1, MD tell you how to scale each one of these dimensions according to whatever you think, you know, like let's say you have maybe temperatures in Celsius and Fahrenheit, you know exactly the scaling factor to turn all of them into let's say temperatures in Celsius.
yeah, um, I want to move on to another distance. So let me know when you write this out. Okay. The next one will be cosine distance, which is very uh, frequently used in NLP when you deal with text. All right, uh, so we'll have uh, this distance being defined as uh, one minus cosine between the uh, angle between A and B. Um, and then cosine, uh, if, if you remember from uh, whatever high school math, uh, is given by the scalar product between A and B or the norm of A times B. Okay, or maybe you have seen this form that the scalar product equals to A times uh, the norm of A and B times the cosine of the theta, which is the uh, angle between them. So maybe that's more the formula you have seen uh, more often. Okay, um, and then if you forgot as well, uh, the scalar product between two vectors is just the uh, element y. We do the um, sum of the product of their uh, corresponding dimensions and the norm equals to the sum of the square uh, of the squares of the dimensions. Okay, so what do you think? Is this a metric? It's similar, but not exactly the same. So here we are taking the cosine of the angle and then angular distance, which we'll talk about next is the one where you just take the angle. But the distance between the angle and the distance between the same. Sorry, second. Taking the distance, the angle between vectors, the cosine, and the symmetric. Symmetric? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. That's not symbol in terms of like the cosine. Oh, it's just. um. This one is like an angle between A and B. Yeah. Or, you know, these are A and B, then this is, you know, it's the same thing. Okay, so uh, one thing that one hold is that uh, the cosine distance between A and B uh, will, um, um, let me check just a moment, um, will not be zero if and only uh, A equals to B. Um, for example, you can take the cosine between A and 2A and uh, this will be uh, zero because the angle between A and you know, just a higher magnitude of A will be, you know, they will be on the same line and therefore the, the angle will be zero, the cosine will be uh, one. So um, this is kind of like a contra example. Uh, so we don't have the, this property to hold. And we also, the triangle inequality is not holding. So this is not necessarily smaller than this. Um, and again, you can construct um, an example to show this. The one um, I managed to just construct is one, zero, B equals zero to one, and C equals to one over square of two. If you plug these numbers into the this, uh, inequality, which doesn't hold, you will see that the left side is larger than the right side. Okay, so we don't have these two property to hold. Uh, let me see which numbers I used for them. 
Uh, just went so this is this was the second property and this was the fourth property. So these two things didn't uh, hold. Um, and but still, it is very widely used. And the reason why it is very popular is the fact that magnitude of the of the of the vector doesn't really matter here. Or you are looking at is this angle. Uh, so, for example, in, with text, you can you can have um, just a longer text. Um, and the fact that it's longer, if we represent it with a vector that has uh, counts of each words in its uh, you know dimensions. Uh, this kind of representation will immediately give to this uh, longer, longer document a vector with a higher magnitude. But it's not really important if we are measuring the similarity of, of two documents. The length of the one should just be irrelevant for, for this. So um, this is why it's very common you know, when we deal with text. However, as it was hinted on, there is one distance which is similar. And um, and it's going to be actually super useful for us because we can build an LSH technique over it. So the angular distance uh, between A and B will just uh, be the, the, the angle between A and B. Um, so if we have, let's say B, if we have A, uh, this will be angle between them, and let's call it theta, just to make um, our life easier. And this one will be metric. Okay. Um, for some reason, in the Mining Massive Datasets book, they call this one the cosine distance, and that can be very confusing when you read that chapter. So I don't unfortunately have the, uh, the number of the chapter here, but the chapter name is cosine distance. What they are talking about is angular distance. And then they say cosine distance is a metric, which is not correct. So uh, just watch out if you are reading that chapter in the book that there is a, a little bit of, um, yeah misrepresentation over there. Okay, um, another way to write uh, the angular distance is to use um, arc cosine. So arc cosine of the cosine between A and B, which is theta. And we have just reminded ourselves that the cosine be between A and B is equals to the scalar product over the norm of these things. Um, if, if these two uh, vectors, A and B, are unit vectors, then you will have this formulation of angular distance, which we will also see in the literature. But this formulation called is uh, true only if these two things are unit vectors. So you might see these different variations. And now, uh, again, going back to high school, or at least my high school, um, there is this property if you have A and B and the, 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 um, the angle between them, the value of the angle in the radians is equal to the arc length between A and B. So what you will see when people talk about angular distance, they will also say, oh, this is just the arc length between A and B, which is true if we talk about uh, the angle in radians, not in degrees. So there is also that. Okay, um, what time is it? Let me let me go over why angular distance uh, can be used in LSH, and then if we have time, we'll do another poll where we'll practice cosine and and the um, angular distance on an example. Okay, so if you remember ages ago when I said. Jacquard similarity and mean hash and family of hash functions is not the only thing which we can combine to get an LSH technique. And now we are going over these distances to find another one um, and another family of hash functions. So that's what we are going to do right now for one example. Then again, Jacquard and Angular with mean hashing and hash functions we are going to see right now are not the only ones. So for many of these distances, you can find a way to use them in an, um, in an LSH. 
Okay, so um, let me see how I will do this. So for um, defining a family of hash functions with uh, angular distance that will have all the nice properties that mean hashing a uh, family of hash functions had, we are going to need uh, to define the, uh, the set of all unit vectors in RD. And usually we use the symbol like this. Okay. Um, and for the sake of this illustration, let's pretend A and B are also in the uh, unit vectors. You can compute angular distance with vectors which are not unit vectors, but for now, let's just uh, focus on the ones that are. So now a family of hash functions that is basically the equivalent of our, not an equivalent, has the, all the nice properties that the mean hashing family of hash functions had for Jacquard similarity will be uh, a family where we are going to pick um, some um, unit vector at random. So we are just picking a unit vector at random. And then our hash function will be um, equal to a sign that we get when we have a scalar product of uh, that vector we have just picked with whatever other vector. Okay, so to make me write it down a little bit less compact, for we pick u, which is a unit vector, and then a hash function for some vector a will be plus one if scalar product between a and u is larger than zero and minus one otherwise. Okay. Okay, and now uh, important thing for us will be that the probability of such hash functions over a choice of unit vectors that the two vectors A and B will end up in the same bucket will be equal, uh, equal to uh, one minus angular distance between A and B over pi. So, Remember when we had talked about Jacquard similarity, we had similar uh, kind of formulation. We had that the probability of the things ending up in the same bucket, if we use mean hashing as a hash function will be equal to Jacquard similarity. Here we are using this newly defined hash function. And under that hash function, we will have a probability of two things colliding equal to something that includes the angular distance. Okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's try to um, derive that. Okay, so did we write this down? Yes, okay. Not yet. <laughs> I ask, but I just hear what I want to hear. Okay. So um, while we are on this slide, I, I deleted that the A and B are unit vectors. It's going to confuse you if it's here with this um, definition. They don't have to be unit vectors, but for the sake of illustration of why the probability holds, I will put them to be unit vectors. So if you had written there that they are unit vectors on this slide, just delete that. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Can you go over the set of all half function definition again? Yeah, you first pick a unit vector, um, uniform, random. This means you're just using a uniform distribution over all the unit vectors. So you are just picking one random. Using a uniform distribution. Yeah. This is um, just a mathematical way of saying pick a random unit vector. From our you do that, and then your hash function is defined by that like unit vector. Remember when we had uh, with mean hash functions, then they were defined by the permutation. 
this is similar. So what was kind of like permutation, what was defined in the hash function, unit vector is defined in our hash function now. So once we have fixed it, we are going to define hash function HU as uh, just giving us the sign of a scalar product of that unit vector with any other vector we want. And that's going to be hash function of that vector. Um, something that is incorrect here or not precise enough is this. So we are calculating the hash value of the vector A. So we don't need you. All right, um, I am moving on. So now for the to show why this probability holds, we are going to use uh, A and B, which are on a unit circle, okay? And um, I want to remind you that the angular distance between A and B, one interpretation of them, of the angular distance is that this is a minimal arc length between uh, A and B. And this is going to be an important interpretation of what angular distance is um, for, for going over why this probability holds. Okay, so now uh, let's look at all the uh, vectors U where their scalar product with some vector A can uh, will be larger, uh, will be uh, non-negative. So let's say we pick this, this vector A, then all vectors U that have a co positive cross product with uh, vector A will be in this region here. Okay. Um, otherwise, um, if all these vectors here in this region will have the angle which A that is not uh, between minus 90 to 90 degrees, and then the cosine will not be positive. That's the point. Okay, um, similarly, let's uh, find uh, this region for some uh, some um, vector B. So here we have vector B. Again, we just uh, look at all the uh, angles, possible angles that are between minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees with B, and all of them will be over here. So these are all U such that the scalar product between B and U is oops, positive. Okay, now gets a little bit uh, funky part. Um, try to kind of mentally merge these two circles together with these images. That's what I'm going to try to visualize, but I'm restricted by this pen and this iPad. So here we are having these two regions. One of them looks something like this, and the other one is here, okay? We have A to here, and we have B somewhere here. Now try to, in this one, in the third circle, imagine where the positive, where both of these have the same uh, sum. So, so region where both cross product with A and cross product with B is positive. Try to visualize that. Um, if you visualize that, it's going to be this region over here, right? And this region over here where both cross products will be negative. So only in these two sides, that is here and here we have Vectors U, where product with A will be positive, but cross product with B will be negative, another way around. Here will be uh, positive with B and negative with A. Okay, so what we are getting at is actually probability that these two things will not hash to the same value. And this is why we are looking at this region where the signs are different. Remember, signs are what our values of hash function are. Okay, now 
again a while ago. Um, no, uh, so we said this is the arc length. It's basically the same as the angle irradiance because we just shifted these things for 90 degrees. These things are also uh, have the same angle. So it's, it's very simple. Like you're just rotating things for this this angle. That's why these things are also to the same angle. But we said that angle and the arc length are the kind of the same thing. So we know that this is the same arc length, right? If this was D, this was D, and this is D2. Okay. All right. That's useful, useful visualization for showing that the probability of these two hash values are not the same. Uh, because we have two times b possible degree values and there are two times angular distances values where we can hit you where these two things won't have to the same same function so this is just the probability of outcomes this is our world two b these are all the degrees okay that's all the possibilities now we will add possible uh, possible u where the half values will not match and these are exactly b and we have two one b and other b of our possibility which is two times b so this gives us all together a probability that these two things won't hash and then we know that the probability of them hashing is just one minus that Um, sometimes you will see this written in a slightly different form. Um, this is actually um, here. I'll put it in brackets. Sometimes you will see uh, something called angular similarity defined, and it will be equal to pi minus angular distance. So Um, all right, so actually that's no, let me just so, um, which means that this is equal to one minus s angular between a and b. Okay, because you just rearrange these things and you will see this. Um, okay, we have shown this and you can actually then uh, make the same uh, exercise you would do for Jacquard similarity and mihash functions when we talked about their property of being uh, um, D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive. And then you will find that this one is also, this one is P1, P2, P minus D1 over P, P minus D2 over P sensitive. So just bringing everything back to that definition that both of these uh, two setups, one being with min hash family of hash functions, and the other one uh, uh, being with this new hash uh, family of hash functions where we take the sign, have this uh, property of uh, being P1, P2, and D1, D2 sensitive special values of D1 and D2. All right, so great. I managed to say this some time. Um, I hope this kind of makes you happy that there is another one uh, combination for the LSH technique. We didn't go over all of the distances. I didn't even plan to do that. But if you go back to the notes that are referenced in the calendar, you will see also KL divergence, edit distance, there is Hamming distance, and so on. So we didn't have time to cover every single distance in the world. Just know that there are more of them. And then if you are working on a project that didn't need something different, another type of distance that might be useful for you might exist. Uh, and also remember that there are more distances we can combine with certain family of hash functions that we use in a LSH. These are not the only, only two. Um, also, if you want to solve the poll because you don't have anything better to do, I will just activate it and leave it here. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, that's all. Thanks. I will just try to open it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, having distance, there is some uh, use. Um, for example, you can do something very similar. Uh, let me just turn off all of the all of the YouTube things.